particle effects. Everybody loves them, they bring that juice to your game, making them sparkle and shine and stand out from the crowd. But they can also be pretty hard to make. The Unity Particle System Renderer has a lot of features, which is great if you know what you're doing, but daunting if you don't. And so in this video, I'm gonna be giving out some simple tips and tricks that will let you turn this into something more like this. Let's get started. When designing your particle effect, you should think about how you're gonna structure the effect's beginning, middle, and end. Generally, the beginning of the effect should be attention-grabbing. It should have a lot of motion or contrast to draw the player's eye. The middle of your effect should then linger in place so that the player has a moment to register what it is that they're looking at. And finally, we want the effect to gracefully end without drawing any further attention to itself. You could make the particles fade out or scale out, or you could even make them animate out using a custom texture. These guidelines are not absolute. It depends a lot on the specifics of the effect that you're making, but I find that they are a good starting point most of the time. Now, let's break down some of the effects I've made for my action roguelike game patch quest so that you can see these guidelines in action. When the player is hurt, a flashing damage effect appears behind them, like this. This effect is pretty important because in a bullet hell roguelike game, it's essential that the player knows exactly when they've been hit. For the beginning, I made this particle rapidly switch between white and black. This creates a high contrast area that immediately stands out even in the player's peripheral vision. The effect then lingers in place for just a moment so that it registers clearly as a star. This is a fast paced effect, so I don't want it to stay there much longer than it has to. Then it begins to disappear from the inside out. This is a neat trick because it lets you keep the outline of an effect stable while you eat away at its interior. To do this, I used an animated texture where the hole inside the star increases a little bit with each frame. I've included this texture, along with all the other ones I'll cover, in the description box for everybody to use in their own projects. As a final note, I used a second particle system to make smaller copies of this same star. This adds a little bit of extra juice without overcomplicating things. When making a fast effect like this one, it's important to use clear, bold shapes so that it can be understood in just a fraction of a second. Here's the effect being used in-game again. This next effect is slightly more complex. These turtle monsters have a move called Geyser, which lets them fire a series of projectiles upwards before gravity brings them back down. This effect has two parts. The water particles have pretty simple behavior. They scale in, linger for a moment, and then scale out. But they look a lot more flashy than this because they're using a looping animated texture. This texture is divided up by these white lines. You can think of the lines as being like steps in an escalator. They move a little bit upwards on each frame, and by the final frame, they've reached the starting point of the step above them. This way, they can loop indefinitely. These droplet particles then back up the effect by adding some extra detail. Note that I place several droplets on the same texture. I could have made each of these a separate particle, but that way I would have needed dozens of particles, and that would be pretty inefficient. This way I can create a whole bunch of droplets using just 10 particles. Here's this effect being used in-game again. Now, let's look at something a little more fancy. These slug monsters have a move called Fumigate, where they release a cloud of poisonous gas. This effect has a few different parts. The skull is the focal point. It scales in, lingers for a second, and then fades out. The jittery hand-drawn effect is created using an animated texture. I just drew four different copies of the skull that were all slightly different, and then cycled through them at a low frame rate. It's a pretty easy effect to make, really. The skull is backed up by two types of smoke. The darker smoke is very simple, it just scales up and then fades away over time. This is designed to pad out the background of the effect and obscure the ground behind it. The lighter smoke is a little more complex. It animates out using another animated texture. 
Here I also used the trick of keeping the outline roughly steady while the interior gradually breaks down. This smoke is quite detailed, and to keep the overall complexity of the effect down, I use fewer particles of this type than the other type. Here's all the pieces back together again, and here's this effect in-game again. So hopefully you found it helpful to see these effects broken down like that. They're all made up of relatively simple particle systems. I didn't use any special programming or advanced features to make them. Again, I think it really comes down to creating a smooth transition through the beginning, middle and end of your effect, where you grab the player's attention, hold it for just a moment, and then gently let go. Now I'm gonna show my workflow for making an animated particle texture. This is the effect we're gonna make, a big glowing fireball. For software I'm using Adobe Flash. Nowadays this is called Adobe Animate, but I haven't upgraded in a long time, so I'm still using Flash. For hardware, I'm using a Wacom Cintiq tablet. This is one of the more expensive tablets because it comes with a built-in screen. But I feel it was a really good investment because I can draw directly onto the tablet as if it was paper, and you can get much better hand-eye coordination that way. Now, before we start animating, my first step is always to look up some reference work since there's no point in completely reinventing the wheel. I like using Pinterest for this. What I'm trying to do here is just work out the general principles behind animating fire, the kinds of shapes and colours and motions that fire makes. We can see that fire tends to flow gracefully, while at the same time moving fast and erratically. This makes it pretty hard to animate, but we'll cope. As for colours, we can see that fire starts out white hot and then turns to yellow, before fading through red and ending up as dark smoke. Fire also cools down from the outside in. Okay, that was some good research. Now I'll jump straight into animating. The first step is to create the outlines. Of course, I want to keep in mind what I said earlier about the beginning, middle and end of a particle effect. I find that the best particle textures are roughly circular, so I'm going to animate this as a ball of fire that explodes outwards and then fades away. For the beginning of this animation, I've made a rapidly expanding cloud shape. I have the onion skin feature turned on, which means that I can see the shadows of the frames immediately before and after the current one. This makes it easier to ensure that my frames are flowing well. For the middle of this animation, I want the cloud to linger in place, but for the ending it needs to gradually hollow itself out. So I compromised by keeping the top half of the cloud steady, while creating a hollow space on the bottom that gradually expands. After a few frames of this, I figured the animation was looking a little flat, so I added this second hollow space on the right. This gives the fire a little more character with a slightly more erratic outline. Eventually, it reached a point where these hollow spaces joined up, creating a little puff of flame that was separated from the rest of the cloud. I think this detail looks pretty good. Then, as we head into the ending, I made these two clouds continue to hollow out until they disappeared. At this point, I noticed that the animation was 18 frames long. This is a problem, since textures need to be sized at a power of 2 on each side, and therefore you'll get best results if your animation is itself a power of 2 frames long. So I tried to find the two frames that were contributing the least to the animation, and I deleted them, bringing us down to 16 frames. I then decided that this animation was still a little too flat, so I tried to add depth by marking out some extra space inside the hollow section. The idea was to make this section a lighter colour, so that it's as if you're looking into the inside of the fireball as it expands. Okay, so we've got our basic outline. I'd say this is actually the hardest part done, since we've gone from a blank canvas to the basic shape of each frame. At this point, I noticed that the gaps between some of the frames were very large. If you play the animation back at a high frame rate, you wouldn't even notice this, but if you play the animation back slowly, this would make it look abrupt and jittery. 
which definitely isn't what we want from fire. So at this point I decided to insert a blank frame in between each frame, and then I drew a tween on each of these blank frames. This process is kind of tedious, but it's not very difficult if you make good use of the onion skin feature. Once done, we now have a 32 frame outlined animation that looks great even when played back at slow speed. Now we can finally add some colour. I changed the background to a nice deep blue since it will contrast with our fire colours. I then went through each frame colouring it starting with white and then fading through yellow to red and eventually black. I kept the underside a little bit lighter than the top side to help create the feeling that the fire is hotter in the middle. These colours took some fine tuning to get to the point where I was happy with them. At this point I started removing the grey outlines. This makes the animation look brighter and hotter. And another problem with outlines is that they don't scale well. If you blow up a texture with outlines then the outlines get blown up too and it's very obvious that your effect has been scaled. Without them, the original size of your texture is a little more ambiguous. Here I'm using the paint inside feature to paint over the outlines while leaving the fills untouched. Then to create a little more depth I added a shadow on top of the cloud. Normally you don't add shadows on top of things, but in this case it makes sense because the light is actually coming from inside the fireball. And finally I added some little sparks that fly out at the very start of the animation, just to make it look that little bit more explosive. And there we go, this is the final animation. The whole process took me the best part of two hours, but your mileage may vary there. Personally, I'm very happy with how it turned out. There's a couple of ways to get this animation into Unity. What I did here was convert the animation into a symbol and then place a box around it on a separate layer. I then used these boxes as a guide to line up all the frames on a grid. And then I hid the boxes, leaving us with our final texture. I also turned the effect on its side because Unity expects particle effects to be moving towards the right. I wanted each frame of the animation to be 256 pixels large, which means that the final texture was 2048 by 1024 pixels. This is fairly big, but it's not going to break anyone's GPU budget. I could then load this into Unity and apply it to a particle system. To animate the texture, you want to turn on the texture sheet animation module and then fill in the correct number of columns and rows. And here's this particle effect being used in game. Finally, I want to finish with some coding tips. First off, it can be a hassle keeping track of when each particle effect needs to be destroyed. To simplify this, I've created a script that lets particle effects destroy themselves after they stop running. This script is very simple. On the first frame, we try to access this object's particle system, if it has one. Then on every frame after this, we check to see whether the system has stopped running. If it has, we delete the entire object. You should place this script on the top object of your effect, and you should make sure that none of the particle systems have looping enabled. Sometimes you want a particle effect to follow another object. The obvious solution is to parent the effect to that object, but this has a problem. If the parent object is, for one reason or another, destroyed, then any child effects will also be immediately destroyed. This means they might not play all the way through. To solve that, I use this effect tracker script. This script can make effects follow an object without being parented to that object. It's also fairly simple. We have a list of tuples containing an effect and a tracking target. We can add values to this list using the static track method here. Then once per frame, we iterate through the list and we check whether both the effect and the target still exist. If either of them has been destroyed, we stop tracking this effect. But if they both still exist, then we reposition the effect so that it's on top of the target. Note that we iterate backwards through this list. That's because we are deleting elements from it as we go, and this makes it unsafe to iterate forwards. 
Also note that this script uses a static list and you should therefore only have one of them in your scene. Game development is messy, complicated and difficult, but hopefully this video helped you out in some way. You can find the scripts and the animated textures I talked about in the description box below, and if you want to see more game dev videos like this one in the future, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. In other news, I'm releasing a big free demo for Patch Quest in just two weeks. So if you're interested in playtesting the game, be sure to stay tuned. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.